Dr. Emily Trinan is an Associate Professor of Music and Director of Bands at the University of Minnesota School of Music in the Twin Cities. In this position, she conducts the acclaimed University Wind Ensemble, guides the graduate wind band conducting program, assists in undergraduate conducting, and provides administrative leadership for all aspects of the University of Minnesota Band program. Prior to her position at Minnesota, Dr. Trinan served as the Director of Bands and Artistic Director of Winds and Brass at Temple University's Boyer College of Music and Dance in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Director of Bands at Shenandoah Conservatory, Director of the Duke University Wind Symphony in Durham, North Carolina, and Director of the Concordia University Wind Ensemble in Ann Arbor, Michigan. A strong advocate for music education, Dr. Trinan is a proud Yamaha Master Educator and serves on the Executive Council of the Institute for Composer Diversity. In 2019, Dr. Trinan served as the conductor for the NAFME All-National Concert Band at the National Conference in Orlando, Florida. Dr. Trinan joins us today to talk about selecting repertoire and prepping scores. Well, hello, Dr. Trinan. Welcome to our podcast. Uh, this is a show for our, our junior music education students at Ithaca College, and, and we're really excited to, to have you join us today. How, how are things in Minnesota? Things are doing really well here, all things considered. I um, want to say again, thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, it's exciting to speak to you, and I hope what I say can be helpful for your students. Oh. I will share here at Minnesota, we did get our first big snowfall <laughs> yesterday. We had five inches. So everyone's just, you know, um, kind of surprised. It's a little early, for, even for us, to get some snow. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I thought, and I thought, I think it was bad because it'll snow from November through like, mid-April sometimes, um, but we, we definitely haven't seen any snow yet. Um, it, here in Ithaca, the, the, the skies are just kind of gray for about five months. Is it the same in Minnesota or do you at least get some blue skies? You know what? Um, sometimes it feels like it's gray for a, you know, a, a big long stretch, but we do get some sun every now and then. And you know, on those days where it's like negative 30, those tend to actually be sunny days. Um, oh yeah. That's, you know, the colder it gets, sometimes the more open the sky is, right? But yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, Minnesota does have sun, which is nice. Nice. I, I've been thinking about updating my backgrounds to go along with the seasons. So oh, yeah. Strange in the middle of winter to have this. So I might like get a snow campus uh, background, but yeah, <laughs> we'll see. That's excellent. Yeah, you should do that now then, because, you know, or at least Minnesota, I should do that now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our listeners are, are juniors who are aspiring band directors, and right now they're working um, on Zoom to teach private lessons to students. So they're beginning to, to be thinking about themselves as teachers and as future band directors. So uh, I wondered if you might share some advice for um, what you think new band directors should consider when selecting repertoire for their ensembles. Sure. Well, first of all, every teaching environment is really different. Um, you know, obviously, depending on the grade level, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, that's all very, very different. Um, different challenges, of course, different um, just uh, developments in the in the students, right? Whatever their comfort level is, their insecurities, their you know, puberty, all of that stuff. You have to take that in consideration. So there's that. Um, also, depending on where you get a job, you know, if you're in a very rural environment, um, very distant from large cities, or if you're in a big urban environment, um, suburban environment, I think all of that is really different. Uh, state to state is really different, right? There can be different expectations with curriculum and assessment. So I don't believe there's one size fits all, right? And you really have to know what's going on in your state, um, whatever the requirements are, um, whatever the education, again, assessment pieces are. Uh, um, as I said, that's different everywhere you go. So I think you have to know where you are, know what's expected. Um, I also think when you get a first job, finding out what the last director did and programmed, finding out what worked and didn't work. Um, that can be hard to do. It's not always easy to, you know, connect with that person directly or to get, you know, kind of an honest answer. It really depends on how that person left and, you know, all of those things too. Um, but if you can find out, okay, what kind of music were they doing? What was the grade level? You know, how did it go? Um, I think that's really, really informative. Uh, and I say that because 
I think sometimes we get our first job and we think, okay, great. I've got a high school job. I'm going to go do Hindemith Symphony. <laughs> it's like, well, let's put it all into context and just see what, you know, was going on before. So um, not every environment is the same, you know, and, and a high school band is very different. Um, you know, I have worked with high school level musicians on grade two music grade two. I've worked with high school musicians on grade six music. So it really, really varies um, with all the factors that I listed before. So the more information you can get, the better. Now, I think um, when it comes to finding repertoire, one of the challenges for all of us is knowing a lot of music and knowing what to look for. I think when I first got started, I remember just getting these promo CDs. I don't even know if they do this anymore, but like J.W. Pepper would send these little CDs and a paper thing. And it'd be like the newest grade five piece for your high school band, you know, and I'd pop it in. And, um, and that was how I originally, that was like, and this is back in the nineties, early two thousands, um, how music was disseminated and how you learned about new things, especially for like, you know, developing ensembles. Um, but now, you know, that still may happen, but now there are, there's the internet and there are resources that didn't exist when I was, you know, getting started. And there's so much information out there to like learn about, well, what is out there and what's good. A lot of living composers are self-published and really just trying to get the word out, word of mouth, and they're not affiliated with a publishing company. So you're not going to see someone like Stephen Bryant on a JW Pepper newest and greatest grade five piece or, or, you know, disc or whatever, promo disc. So I think it's our responsibility very much so as educators to just know what's out there and to be exposed to as much music as possible in your discipline. If you're not familiar with windrepertory.org, um, and that might be something Matt, you could just put in a chat or something. That is an amazing resource um, that I think it's maybe almost 10 years old or now or, or something, but it's been around for a little while. Um, and you can literally go on there and like Google grade three composition, you know, boom, and then get all these pieces pop up. So there are lots and lots. We have to expand our palette beyond that. I think that's really important. So um, windrepertory.org, again, that's a great place. Another database that has been up for a couple of years that I do think is important for all of us to consider and to just Google and you know find just whatever names of people and ideas. I think there's, they're working on like the, uh, the administrative part of this they're working on right now and just figuring out how to kind of organize the website because it's now starting to get a lot of attention. But I think that's a fabulous database to just go and explore uh, people of color, people from different, you know, backgrounds um, with different identities. And um, you may not find a piece, you know, a middle school band piece necessarily, but being exposed to composers that are writing, I think is um, a really great place to at least open your ears and be aware of who's out there doing what. So those are the biggest things I can say. We've got to know great rep. You've got to get past the promo CDs or whatever. And you've just got to explore a little bit as best you can. Ask your friends, you know, what's what's interesting out there for my, you know, grade three, grade two, grade four kind of ensemble. Um, admittedly, the grading system is flawed. I think you probably all know that. Not every grade four is the same challenge. So I say that grading thing lightly um, because I know that that's you know, again, and also every state has their own grading system and so forth. So, you know, that's a kind of a, a broad generalized way of organizing the ideas of your ensemble. Um, 
So the other thing I would say is I think that, you know, for me personally, when I think about my programming, um, I always have like aspirational goals for me and my ensemble. You know, like I said, if I, if I want the group, I, let's say inherit a band and the general grading is about a grade three, you know, um, I might want to try to program something a grade four, that might be like my goal piece, you know, at the end of a year. So I, I, I like to challenge my students and myself. So I want to try to find a couple of those, you know, program or, or goal pieces, but then I have to make sure I'm smart about what kind of music I pick to set that up. Um, I wouldn't pick one of those, you know, harder, really hard pieces too soon. I think you have to, you know, kind of put that off, do some good foundational work, some good fundamentals, some, you know, other pieces that are like easier in that realm to kind of set you up for success on that. Um, but I do think it's good to have goals and to have some challenges for you and your students. Um, so again, knowing repertoire, setting up challenges, and then, um, I also think that if, if you can think about a balance of old and new, um, I think a lot of times we do only new stuff like latest and greatest, what's just hot off the press. You know, it's a John Mackey just wrote this new piece with all these percussion parts. Let's do that, which is great. No, nothing against that. But don't forget to balance that with some old classic stuff, you know, Granger or Claire Grundman or, you know, pieces that are just great good pieces to learn and do and are orchestrated well um, and students like to play. Uh, there are lots of these kind of old standards, um, Carter, you know, Overture for Winds, these kind of Air for Band, you know, Erickson. Um, there are just some of these like kind of old war horses that will probably be in your library free. You don't even have to pay for it, right? That I would, you know, don't avoid those or try to, you know, like not do those pieces because those are really great pieces, great teaching pieces. They're fun to play. They're kind of timeless um, in that way. And then lastly, I would say if you could, um, you know, really think about what your own philosophy is in programming. Um, you know, I actually do a programming philosophy session quite a bit, you know, at various state conferences. And I never tell people what to play or not play because that's personal and everyone's got their own, you know, frame framework for deciding that. But I think over time for educators actually coming up with like, well, what is my philosophy? And what do I, what do I want to share with my students? Because the repertoire is the most important piece, I think. It's like their diet of what they're going to be exposed to. So my philosophy personally is like, okay, I might work with a student for two to four years, okay? Any student, fill in the blank. And what do I want that student to think band is? And four years is not long, that will fly by. So is band only orchestral transcriptions? Is band only pieces written in the last 10 years? Is band only pieces that are fun and my students can play successfully? you know, and we can win a, a, a first rating? Or is band a beautiful art form where there's specific pieces written just for that medium, not arranged, you know, from voice or piano or, or a pop medley or a film score? Again, nothing against that. I love all that. But I do think it's important that a student walks away from a concert band or marching band or jazz band experience, understanding that those vehicles are on their own wonderful artistic mediums and people are writing music for just that and have written music for just that. Um, and so to expose our students to that, I think is really important. Um, personally, that's my philosophy. But I do think we, over time and over years of teaching, you do, I think it's important to come up with your own philosophy of, well, what is good band teaching? And how do you want to kind of move forward in your own work um, with your own philosophy of what that looks like? Thank you. I, I must admit that my my internet froze at the the most inopportune time. We just missed the the name of the second database. I think you were you were talking about the composer diversity database, right? I got gathered from context. So mm -hmm. um, just for listeners, that's uh, composerdiversity.com, and I'll put both the link to that and the Wind Repertory website um, in in our uh, in our show notes <laughs> so that people can can find those. So uh, thank you for that. So once once um, our aspiring band directors have selected a piece of repertoire, do you have any recommendations for how they prepare those and and maybe keeping in mind that they might have 
many different ensembles and a lot of scores. So with limited time, you know, what, what are some recommendations you have for, for them to learn the scores effectively and efficiently? Yeah. You know, um, obviously the ideal situation, this is for all of us, right? The ideal situation is that, you know, you are in an environment or you've been somewhere long enough that you can study over the summer. <laughs> That's the ideal situation is that you can pick your music like in May, because you know what's going to happen in the fall, you know who to expect. This is not going to happen for anyone in their first year. Impossible. Okay. It's not going to happen. But, you know, over the course of three or four years, you can be like, all right, I know, you know, this class is coming in. I'm going to have a great hot shot oboe player. I'm going to have great percussion, da, da, da. So you'll know over time, like what to expect. And ideally, you know, picking 10, 15, whatever amount of pieces that will suit that, you know, pick those in May, pick those in June and then start studying them, you know, over the summer and study them, not like as a, you know, you've got to study, but because you're like curious and like, wow, the more you kind of know how, you know, overture for wins goes, then just think of how fun that first rehearsal will be because you're not like just trying to scramble. Is it a two, four, or four, four, you know? Um, so again, over time, I think giving yourself like a, like an annual schedule of when you can try to digest those scores uh, is really important. Obviously, at the college level, that's a lot easier for us because we we generally have an idea of what you know we can expect to happen in the fall. So I do all my picking of repertoire, except for this year because of COVID. Um, but usually by May, and then I take you know June through August to really dig into those scores. Now, when I was teaching high school, and especially those first couple of years where it's just like you know you are just in survival mode, you know that's real. Um, and my first job, I was the only band director and I did what a lot of people do, which is you know, like two concert bands, jazz band, marching band, pep band, madrigal, madrigal dinners, musical theater, um, international baccalaureate. We had a music listening contest. I mean, I was in the band room from, I think, 6 a.m. till probably 9 p.m. most days um, trying to do all that. So I, I get it. I've been there. And I loved it. It's exhausting, but I loved it. Um, and I, I think, first of all, when you first get started studying scores, it's con it's daunting because you go from music ed where you're like, you know, you get like one piece, you get a sort of survey, and you get some time to actually study it. Then all of a sudden, you're like, holy cow, we've got a concert to do. It's like it goes from like sort of pacing which seems like comfortable and easy to just like whoa you know tidal wave of like holy cow you've got so much to do you can hardly breathe um so i i think as far as like how do you kind of get there quickly you know obviously that's not the ideal scenario but you know i i do use colored pencils here's what i do i photocopy my scores so i don't like write on the the one i just spent 20 bucks on right make a photocopy bind it and then use colored pencils, you know, right at the top left, I say like tempo, quarter note equals four, four. Okay, and just write it in big red. So I know anytime there's like a meter change, put it in red, <laughs> you know, anytime there's a tempo change, put it in red, you know, just like, this is like bare bones survival. Okay. And then, um, you know, if there's something like, I don't know, like a, if there's a storyline or something interesting about the piece I want to share, of course, I read that. Um, I try to get any kind of like quick, quick background info on the composition, the composer, so I can share that with my students. I scan through it to see like, okay, are there any rhythmic motives that return? You know, like da 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 da. <laughs> like, do I see that a lot? You know, are there any like sort of patterns that I can just see without having to like throw on a recording or whatever? But what can I see? And just sort of say, okay, and, and, you know, like, these are some things I'll take a big post-it note. I'm a post-it note junkie. I mean, I still use them, right? A big one. I stick it on there and I'll be like rhythmic elements, you know, and whatever, you know, if there's 16th note passages or whatever kind of rhythm, I'll just put that there. So I know like, okay, this piece kind of has these elements to it. Um, key, 
Like, is it in the key of F? Is it in the key of B flat? What is it in? I write that there. So I know for my warm ups, then I can do like a warm up scale in that key and rhythmic exercises in that key or in those little motives. Um, so that's like the kind of crash course of like, what do I, what are like the essences of what I look at? So a little bit of background, usually it's in the inside of the score. If not, I go to Google, what's this piece about? Um, key center, tempo, meters. Um, and then, it, you know, then if I've got a little more time, you know, I try to, I really try to read it and not just throw on a recording. I try to like trust my eyes and trust my internal hearing. Um, before I do the recording thing. Uh, once in a while, you know, if like you've got a recording, you're like, okay, how does this go? Just, but here's the thing with listening to recordings. Um, you know, it's kind of the thing everyone's like, never listen to recording. Um, I disagree with that. I think you don't want to conduct to recordings. That's, that's where it gets dangerous. So listening and like studying a score, no big deal. Everyone does that. But when you start to move to a recording, the challenge with that is, you're actually training your brain to respond to sound. And as conductors, we're supposed to initiate sound, not respond to sound. So when you start conducting and you can't hear yourself like hitting an object, right? You're just conducting in space. So your brain will start actually reacting instead of initiating. So then when you're in front of a group and you're doing that, the group is gonna delay a little bit behind you. So if you're like, if you're, you know, training your brain to respond and you're just slightly behind, they're going to get more behind and then tempo issues get really messy. So that's why, you know, everyone's like never conduct a recording. It's not because like they didn't do that in the Paris conservatory and well, you know, bad, bad musician. It's because you're literally training your brain to respond. And that's not what conducting is. Conducting is initiation. So listen to recordings if you have to. Um, you know, I try to do it without, but listen if you can, but just don't record. So those are some like crash courses in study. And then, you know, Matt, I can send you, I've got like an 18 page like score study. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's, please do. well, you know, it's a largely, it comes from the Frank Battisti and Garofalo guide to score study. So just get that book. If you don't have that book, that's something everyone, I think every educator should have in their library. Um, it's all there. Flow charting. I do flow charting, um, mapping, you know, just so I kind of get a visual cue, like a clue of the piece. I'm a big flow charter. And what that is, is like a timeline. I take one piece of paper and I just like write out the whole piece on one eight and a half by 11. I put just details of, with like my hand. I don't use the bubble, the bubbleizer thing. Cause I, I feel like old school, like pen and paper, you know, that works for me. Um, and then I just memorize the piece better. I'm like, okay, great. I know the form. It's ABA. It's in the key of F. You know, it's fast, slow, fast. Boom. I got an idea of the piece. But you need a little more time for those kind, that kind of study. Yeah. Well, I have to say what you, what you said about your caution against conducting to a recording just is a huge light bulb moment for me because um, I, you know, like you said, like, people have always said, you know, don't, don't study scores by listening to recording. Don't do that. But I did to, to think about how, yes, we're training our brain to respond to what we're hearing as opposed to initiating it. I had never thought of it that way. Um, and uh, thinking of our role as the conductor um, and that is our job. I, it makes, it makes a lot of sense to me because in jazz and popular music, it's in, you know, we transmit the, 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 the style and the repertoire uh, orally. So jazz and popular musicians have always listened to recordings to figure out how to perform something because that's how we transmit the music. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, but if you're a conductor of, a, of a, a classical piece, that's not been the history. And also, like what you said, you're literally training the, the, the mind, body, muscle, auditory connections to, to do something that it shouldn't. Um, I had never thought of it that way. Um, and, and I honestly had always kind of, because I have a jazz and popular music background, been like, yeah, but you know, you can listen to the record, you know, that, that's just right. been, because that's how, that's how in those styles, we, we learn music is, is by listening to it. And then we make our own, you know, interpretations and decisions but it, it usually starts with the ear um, and to hear how others have done it before. But yeah, I, I've never thought of it that way. And um, 
yeah, no, that, that's 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 really helpful, and I hope I hope the students are writing that down and taking note of that because I, that's not something I had, I had thought of before. Um, well, and again, you know, I I'm uh, like to reiterate, I also listen to recordings. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's the conducting to them that I think is problematic. Yeah. Um, oh, and yeah, and the other thing I will say, really quick uh, anecdote story. The other downside of listening to a recording, especially when you're trying to really study a score, is that you will be influenced by what you hear um, interpretively, whether you want to or not, whether you're you know, strong-willed or not, you're gonna be influenced. And um, here's a little story, you know, like Fred Fennell, hopefully we all know that name, um, has, a, I think, his first iconic recording of Lincolnshire Posey. I don't even remember what year it is, but that's um, what a lot of people kind of grew up on. My mentors grew up on that. When I first started studying the piece, I was given, like, you must listen to Fred Fennell's recording. And it's amazing, right? And it's beautiful. And I have utmost respect for Fred. Um, there's one moment in the fifth movement that and, and a lot of people would like kind of use that as like tempo right this is the tempo this is kind of the right thing to do just like when fred Fennell slowed down in the first movement of the whole suite before the inversion you know everyone slows down there but the score doesn't say to slow down there right but everyone does because fred Fennell did right so there's a moment like that in lincolnshire posey in the fifth movement and um you know, and I, I think I had listened to the recording, but I wasn't listening to it while I was studying and I wasn't practicing with it. So rewind the clock, 2009, I'm at a conducting workshop, you know, I'm a young conductor, I'm not anymore, but I used to be. Um, and I was, it was the West Point Academy band and um, Frank Wicks, who recently passed away, unfortunately, but director of bands down at LSU was the master clinician and it was with the West Point musicians. So this is a professional band. It's not a college group, you know. And um, it was a very you know, intense and high pressured environment. And we got two or three rehearsals and then we were able to perform with the group. So I was doing movements four, five and six of Posey. And I get up there and do five and I do the, my stuff. And, you know, I had studied my score my way, my interpretation without listening to recordings. And there's a moment where I took a note and conducted it really long, okay? And Frank in the back, you know, is kind of sitting like this. It's like, no, 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 stop, stop. And, you know, I'm standing up there and I'm, I'm about five, five. And Frank's like, you know, 10, two. Um, no, he's probably like six foot eight. I don't know, but you know what I mean? He's like, seems really tall. So he comes walking up. And I'm on a podium and even when he's like not on a podium, he's still really tall, right? And he looks down, he's like, why are you taking so much time in that bar? Why, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And I'm like, well, you know, right here, slow off lots. I'm doing the eighth note, like, cause that's what we do. And then the eighth note continues here. And therefore it's actually seven beats of eighth notes and slowing down. And the West Point group is just like, you know, cause usually you're just supposed to be like, I don't know tell me what to do, right? So, um, so I, you know, and they're just like waiting, you know, totally neutral. And then Frank looks down and like a long pause, right? Uncomfortably long. And he's like, well, I'll be damned. You're right. And I've never seen anyone do it like that. And I thought, okay, see, if I would have just listened to the recording, and if I would have just trusted that, and I'm not saying you can't trust a lot of that, right? But I wouldn't have noticed that little moment of like one measure that that's what the composer wrote. And it's not in a lot of recordings, you know? Um, but I wouldn't have noticed that if I didn't trust my eyes. So there's my story. Oh, that's a great story. Yeah, and, and perfectly illustrates that point. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Well, um, we're just uh, about out of time, but do you have any other advice you'd like to give to the next generation of uh, band directors here at Ithaca College? Um, you know, it's always hard to give advice, especially if people don't ask for it, <laughs> but- um, oh, oh, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, I guess you did, uh, but your students didn't. They're like, oh. Um, first of all, what we're living through right now is tough. It's tough. Um, I think many of us are trying to be really positive through it, you know, um, 
but it's tough and it's okay that it's tough. You know, like not all things in life are going to be comfortable or easy or um, the way we want it, you know? And I think first of all, like you going through your education right now and just kind of, I'm sure it's, I mean, I'm older and I've got a job, right? So it's easy for me to say this. If you're looking ahead and you're like, wow, what's the future going to be like? We just don't know. That's kind of a scary place and can be a scary place of just living and thinking. Uh, and I think we're all, we're all in that right now. Um, but I will say that major tragedies and situations have always happened in our history as humans, you know, on our planet. And people have, um, people have thrived, maybe not during it, but they've come out of it stronger and better. And music has existed throughout all of that. And music education has existed throughout all of that. Um, the pandemic of 1918, right? There was, you know, the, obviously that impacted the society at the time, but music still existed. Um, you know, the stock market crash, World War I, World War II, um, all, you know, just as you can just look back in history, um, music never stopped. So I believe that there is a place and there will always be a place for people to make music, to be passionate about music, to care about music and to kind of carry this torch forward. Like, yes, this is important. It's an important um, part of our education. It's important for society. It's important for just human well-being. Um, and that, you know, whatever we're in right now, the discomfort, it will pass. And we will have to do some rebuilding and some growth and healing on the other side of this. We know that. Um, and it may not look like what we want it to look like for a little while. That's okay. And we'll come back again, come out of it stronger. But my advice is please don't lose your passion and please don't lose your care for the it, which is music, you know, and, and all of us come to music in different lenses, right? If we're a, you know, a, a gen general um, music educator, if we're a middle school choir educator, if we're a college band director, we're all here because of music. And we're all in our own ways trying to mold and shape and inspire and educate and help the next generation um, in whatever capacity. But again, the, the passion for music and why it's so important for all of us um, and for our society, whatever that looks like, I think we have to, we have to be very, really um, strong advocates for that and to not let you know, whatever external things are happening to not let that impact our passion too much. So I think that's, the, that's the best advice I can give you right now. Oh, no, thank you. That was very inspirational. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And um, I, I, I read a bit of your bio at the beginning of this podcast. But um, with the our student, my students might not know is that uh, I I was a doctoral student at Temple University about 10 years ago, where uh, Dr. Trinan was the director of bands at that point and co-founded uh, a campus community band called the Night Owls, the Temple University Night Owls with my with my uh, mentor, Deb Confredo. And um, it's that was just such an, an incredible experience for me. I was a, a lucky enough to be a, a co-conductor along with a team of graduate students and it was a great experience and to think about how music education moves beyond you know our classroom walls and and to engage with uh, band students or band ensemble members who were just lifelong learners they were adults and educators and nurses and doctors and um that was just such a great experience for me and and so i appreciate you you co-founding that group and and to have um, you now speaking to my students just it, on a personal note it, it means a lot to me so I I thank you so much for for joining us today. Well, again, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with everyone. I do hope that some of these tips um, are helpful. Uh, if nothing else, you've got some new resources that maybe you didn't know about and. Um, you know, we're all in this together, whether we're in Minnesota or on the East Coast, you know, in New York, wherever we're at, we're in this together and we will get through this. Um, and again, keeping your passion really, really fiery and hot and making sure that you're still curious and you're exploring and you're kind of growing in yourself, whatever that looks like. 
Um, and then when, when you, when this is over and we've got jobs and we're giving back, um, that you just remember, you know, you never know the impact you're going to have on people. Um, and music is just a really important part of everyone's life. So not everyone, but many people's lives. And, um, I think it's just always important to remember that. And thank you again, Matt, for inviting me. And like I said, I hope some things were helpful. Oh, absolutely. We'll stay warm and safe amidst the snowstorms in Minnesota. <laughs> I will. That's what that's what cashmere is for, right? And cool. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Trenton. All right. Bye. You too. Thank you, Matt. Okay.